Hello, I'm Paul Kaufman, a member of the Pennsylvania Bar Association's Mock Trial Executive Committee, and I'm coming to you from the Fox Rothschild Center for Law and Society at CCP-TV, the Emmy-nominated television studio at the Community College of Philadelphia. We thank both the Center and CCP-TV for their exceptional help. What I'm here to do today is to try to give you some sense of the role that you've just taken on as a volunteer, and believe me, we're all volunteers, as a district or regional coordinator in the Pennsylvania High School Mock Trial Competition. What we're going to do in this first video is run through the basic schedule of the year and the way that teams advance. And then we're going to turn to some tips and tricks. So the mock trial year starts in September with the school year. But it really gets going in November when the case releases. And the case is the same, I hope you know, for all Pennsylvania high school students. And that triggers the students really taking up their part of the responsibility. And it's a good time for you to take up your part as well. Um, the, there are a few things that have to happen in November and December to lay the foundation, to lay the framework for an excellent mock trial season in your district or region. First, you want to make sure that you're communicating. Principally here, I'm talking about communicating with two different groups. First, with the teams that will be competing, and second, with the courthouses and other facilities that you will be using. So let's take the communication with teams first. The first and most important thing is that they know who you are. <laughs> it's important that they be able to contact you with any questions or any problems, just as I hope you know you can contact us, us anytime with any questions or problems. You need to make sure that the teams get a copy of the conflict form. That is the piece of paper that they will use to tell you if there are particular dates that they cannot compete. That needs to happen in November or very early December because you're going to want as much time with that information as possible. You need to make sure that if you have newer programs, less experienced programs, you have the time to give them a brief introduction to make sure that they know where our mock trial training videos are and as we did last year, doing mock trial basics and a basic case summary, we will be doing for the future as well. So you're able to take a look at that. Um, you need to make sure that the teachers have whatever paperwork they're going to need. Registration for the statewide competition. Make sure that everybody who thinks that they're registered is in fact registered. Every year we have a couple of teams that send the paperwork to their principal or whatever, and it doesn't quite make it to the state. That's not going to be good for your district or your region, and it could create a problem for you in January when you have teams that are registered that you don't have in your records. Also, we are very cognizant of the fact that our competition has a diversity of individuals in it. You need to know early on if you're going to have to make any accommodations in your district or regional competitions. If you have students who are deaf or hard of hearing, you're going to have to be able to communicate with the teams about how you're going to handle those issues. If you have teams with religious accommodations, those are things that you need to know before you start scheduling rounds on days that those teams might not be available or eligible to compete. You should probably let the teams know that you'll be providing them more information and a full schedule of rounds in January if that's when you're able to do it or December if you're able to do it even sooner. You may also want to take a moment to highlight any major rules, issues, or changes. We do this by way of a memorandum that comes out from the executive committee every year, but it helps to point that out to teams because often the teams will not read those. You should make it clear to them that you will do what you can to help them through the rules, but you should also make it clear to them that there are limitations on what you're able to do in terms of rescheduling if they declare a conflict after the conflict declaration deadline, or if you have jurors who are conflicted and you don't know that. And those are all limitations that are fairly common for district and regional coordinators to meet, and you'll just have to let the teams know that that could be coming. The second set of contacts is even more important in the initial phase, and that is you need to make certain that you're going to have the rooms that you need and the judges that you need to run your competition when the time comes. So courthouse dates generally need to be reserved weeks in advance, often sometimes months in advance, and you'll need to contact the different folks who you're going to do within those courthouses. Now in some places that's going to be a presiding or administrative judge, in other places it may be a jury commissioner. If you have any questions about whom you should contact, you may want to reach out to the level above you if you're a district coordinator or a regional coordinator. 
uh, if you're a regional coordinator, the state executive committee, or to your predecessor in that position, to know who the right people within your particular courthouse are to arrange courtroom dates. You should book more court dates and more courtrooms than you think you're going to need. For better or for worse, air competition takes place largely in winter, and winter can mean snow. And if you have snow days, even if they're not snow days in that part of the district, it may be a snow day in a different part of the district or region. And you're going to need to have that surge capacity for the next set of reschedulings if you get there. In December and November, you may also want to be reaching out to the people who will be your judges, reaching out and laying the groundwork with your local bar associations. Um, you need to look at the calendar, not just for the courthouse, not just for the schools, you don't want to do it during an SAT morning, for example, but also if your local bar association has a bit of, big event. You don't want to be trying to recruit judges during your local bar association's annual meeting or other major events. And this is particularly critical if you are in a district or a region that has a smaller number of potential volunteers, because those conflicts can make it very difficult for you to stack your jurors. Okay. That's all of the groundwork that you're going to want to lay. And if you have any questions about that or about anything, please feel free to contact any member of the Mock Trial Executive Committee. Now, in early January, this is where the, the rubber is really going to meet the road from a coordinator perspective. Because you're going to need to pair the teams up, you're need, going to need to set up your courtrooms and your courtroom rounds, and make sure that your judges are locked in and that you're going to have an adequate number of jurors in each panel. Uh, you want to remind the schools of their round one schedules. You want to remind the jurors of their round one schedules. And then you're going to be doing that all through the first week or two in January. And at the end of that time, you're going to want to be publishing a complete schedule for at the very least round one, um, if not able to let teams know when they are likely to be in a non-binding way for round two. Now, late January, into February, middle of February or even late February, depending on your region, is when we expect that the district competition will occur. That may be two rounds, it might be three or four rounds, and depending on how many rounds you need to go in your district before regionals, you need to have a sense of how many dates you're going to need to program and how dense that period is going to be with competition rounds. That is not something that we do from the statewide level. We don't schedule those things for you because we want you to be able to adjust to the particular realities of courthouse scheduling and judicial recruitment in your district or region. In early March is when we expect that our regional competitions will be concluding. Uh, generally, the state competition is toward the end of March, and you want to give your teams at least a week to two weeks between the regional competition and the state competition, and to give yourself that extra surge in case a regional competition gets snowed out, as can happen. So you want to give yourself that extra room. District and regional coordinators need to coordinate with one another so that all of the district coordinators know the time at which they have to have designated their regional champion and or their regional runner-up. Now, let's talk briefly about the competition and how it proceeds. The most important thing for a district competition to recall is that you will need to do each team competing twice, once as the plaintiff or prosecution and once as the defendant, absent absolutely compelling circumstances to the contrary. The first round of your district competition should be seated randomly. The team should be paired by random draw unless your region has a different set of rules that you've had approved by the Mock Trial Executive Committee. The second round should not be random. You should, to the greatest possible extent, power pair. In other words, make sure that your 1 and 0 teams are playing other 1 and 0 teams to the greatest extent possible, consistent with them switching sides. So if you have a region of 10 teams and you have a five plaintiffs win, all the plaintiffs win, you're going to have to have all of your 1 0s versus all your own 1s. But if you only have two prosecution teams win and three defense teams win, you want to make sure those two winning sides are each playing each other, and then you pull up one from your loser's bracket on the prosecution side to fill it out. 
Typically speaking, you will want, as to the extent greatest possible, the best or highest scoring of your teams to play the lowest scoring team on the other side. In other words, the best playing the worst, worst playing the best, again. Um, but that is less of a locked-in rule if you have local circumstances that prevent that from occurring. Ideally, in your circumstance, in your district or region, you will be knocking out as many teams as possible in that second round so that you avoid the need to have a fourth or fifth or sixth round after your third round of competition. So in the preceding example, you would only have three teams at most coming out of that second round that were two win, no loss teams. Advancement beyond there is governed by local custom and you can do it however you think is best. However, to the extent that you have an odd number of teams and you still have to cut down, your basic choices are to either pull up, so your highest ranking one in one team if you have an odd number of teams. So say in that preceding example, you have three two and O teams. You can either give the highest scoring or highest ranked two and O team a bye, have the other two and O teams play, and then have the two and O team with the bye play a three and O team, or you can pull up your highest ranking one and one team and have that one and one team play the highest ranking two and O team, the other two and O teams meet, and it's single elimination from that point forward until you've determined your district or regional champion. In terms of score, we need to point out that the most important thing in high school mock trial is not the points that you score, it's the ballots that you receive. So you have to have an uneven number of jurors scoring around. If you have that and there's a conflict that is declared late so that you have an even number of jurors, the presiding judge must score the round. One thing we don't want to happen is a situation in which one juror who has a particular but idiosyncratic view of the case overruling the other two. So for example, if you have three jurors and two of them see it as a one-point match in favor of prosecution, but one of them sees it as a 10-point win for the defense, the prosecution is the winning team because it convinced two jurors. If you just added up the total points and declared your winner that way, the one idiosyncratic judge who saw things very differently would overrule the wishes of two or even three or four other judges. And that's something that we seek to avoid. Ballots are the way that we determine our winner. Scores are the way that we tie break. Now, if you're looking to tie break, you can do that by average score or by total points. You can only use total points if you have the same number of jurors in every round. If you have one round that has five jurors and one round that has three jurors, you obviously can't use total points. You'll have to use average. Either way is an acceptable way of determining your tiebreaker teams. All right. With that, we're going to close out the, the basics, and we're going to start to talk about some tips and tricks. These have been collected from other regional and district coordinators and experienced folks. But the thing I want to stress here, and that I will stress again, is if you have questions of any kind, please take a good look at the coordinator handbook that we put together every year, which has a fuller description of all of your duties and all of the issues that you're likely to face. And please, please, please do not hesitate at all to contact a member of the Mock Trial Executive Committee if you have any questions. Most of us have been district or regional coordinators, sometimes for many years. And at the very least, we have access to the version of the rules that are likely to be applied, and we have the access to one another and the collective wisdom of the entire statewide apparatus. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask us. Thank you.